Uh, I'm happy to be here. I sit up here with my uh, cup of coffee so that uh, uh, I ha the, it, it seems to me in a way that uh, the uh, coming of uh, non-Mormon scholars into the Mormon field was started, and I see Richard is, is frowning, 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 but uh, <laughs> way back in 1973, or that is 1972, the fall of 1972 at the Western History Association where we met at, uh, uh, we met, at, I think we, were, we met at, uh, uh, in New Haven. And uh, all the Mormon scholars were to get together for dinner and the, the waiter came around and asked if anybody wanted a drink, and, and Richard said, oh, no, 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 no. And I said, just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I've always uh, found a way to let people know that I'm a Methodist. Though if, <laughs> if it had been uh, 30 years ago, even a Methodist couldn't have had a drink. <laughs> okay. Whenever election time comes around, the general authorities of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints remind local leaders across the United States to encourage the members of the church in their wards to take an active part in the political process. In a priesthood meeting in one of the many wards in Provo, Utah, not long ago, this reminder was delivered by one of the high priests. He said that at a specified time, the Republican men in the ward should gather in a nearby school auditorium. At the same time, the Democratic men should gather in the school's broom closet. <laughs> <laughs> that is a story that is, I regard as a true story since it came to me from Bert Wilson, the, uh, the the eminent folklorist of Mormon studies. It is possible that there, there may be isolated wards in blue states where there are more Democrats than Republicans, but the number of Democrats in virtually every sector of Utah and the other states in the Mormon culture region, except the urban areas where non-Mormons live, and they now call themselves Gentiles, live in, a, in live an incredible disparity now exists between highly Republican, conservative Mormons and moderate Democrat Mormons. Because this state of affairs has existed without a change in the outcome of presidential elections in Utah since 1968 in the, and in the vote for governor since 1984, and also because a great majority of LDS church leaders in Utah moved into the Republican Party after the Mormon People Party was forced to give way in order for Utah to become a state in 1896, many modern observers are under the impression that Utah has always been extremely conservative. Yet as the history of Mormonism reveals, this movement was not conservative, but virtually re revolutionary throughout the 19th century. Its members experimented with radical social and economic systems, although it was also a time for a theocracy, or as it called itself, a theodemocracy, that was both powerfully patriarchal and strictly hierarchical. If Mormons in Utah were not always conservative, and they were not. It was often Republican in the last century's early decades. It is important to remember in the, in the early decades, however, that the Republicans were the progressives. But as these timelines, and someone is gonna put the timeline up there on the, the screen, as this timeline uh, indicates, the Mormon state did not always vote Republican. As is obvious in this timeline that combines the vote in Utah for both the governor of the state above in the, the red above and the president of the nation with the numbers across the, the bottom, 
uh, by far the most Democratic Utah voters ever were in the years from 1932 to 1948. During the Eisenhower administration, it was solidly a Republican, a period when Mormon Apostle Ezra Taft Benson was Secretary of Agriculture, the highest civil executive office ever held by a Latter-day Saint up to that time. But following the Eisenhower, the state voted for John F. Kennedy in 1960 and for Lyndon Johnson in 1964, and Democratic governors suffered served Utah from 1964 through 1984, even though the state voted for Republican candidates for president during those years. Since 1984 till now, however, the state has been so solidly Republican and intensely conservative that it has seemed unnecessary for national Republican candidates to do much campaigning in the state. Before returning to this remarkable conservative turn that led to the high priest jest about Latter-day Saints who were Republican meeting in an auditorium while Latter-day Saints who were Democrats could meet in a broom closet, it is necessary to examine very briefly Utah during the New Deal years when the state's population continued to be overwhelmingly Mormon. As early as 1902, the administration of the church shifted away from its traditional pattern. I'm saving time by not saying of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but it's always here, you know. <laughs> of course, shifted away from its tradi traditional pattern of encouraging all Latter-day Saints, especially new converts, to settle in the Great Basin. But their advice to stay in the world but not off it of it was often honored in the breach. Excepting in a few urban areas where the church was organized into local stakes, wards, and branches, plus a few areas on the, the Pacific coast, the Mormon world was still subdivided into Zion and the mission field. And so many mission field Mormons wanted to reside in Zion despite the reality that the resources of the Mormon culture region could not support all of them, that it caused trouble. This was especially uh, true in Utah, Mormonism's central place, where agriculture had been the main source of income throughout the 19th century. In the 20th century, this same situation obtained even though the state's economy was increasingly integrated into the nation, national economy through the commercialization of agriculture. The advent of a sizable business sector, and most particularly the grew, growth of corporate mining and of manufacturing, notably, notably beet sugar and the processing of agricultural products. The development of railways other than the Union Pacific and the coming of urban utilities, including interurban railways from Salt Lake City to Ogden, Ogden and to Utah County, allowed the population to take advantage of the new economy by daily traveling to where manufacturing was taking place. As a result, Utah became the most industrialized state in the Mountain West. For all that, however, since so much of the state's manufacturing was tied to agriculture, the agricultural depression that hit the nation in the 1920s was devastating to Utah. The state was suffering economically long before the advent of the Great Depression, a circumstance that surely added to the vote that defeated Senator Reed Smoot in 1932 and led to, led to the state's choice of a Democratic president. And note the, the, this uh, uh, check mark in 1936, because we'll get that in a minute. The collapse of the, the stock market in 1929 and the onset of the Great Depression led Utah to an unemployment rate of 35.8%. Not surprisingly, as New Deal programs were put into place to help the poor and the unemployed, 
Utah's citizens were quick to take advantage of them. The Utah state government likewise accepted available funds from Washington to establish state welfare programs and other state programs to assist the unemployed. In 1933, more than a fourth of the Utah population was not exactly on the dole, but accepting various forms of public help. During these early, and I should say that much of these, this information about Utah economy comes from the very good articles in a book called Utah's History uh, that uh, was edited by Richard Paul and, and Tom Alexander and, and a few others uh, that uh, uh, were, was written by John Bluth and Wayne Hinton. During these early depression years, LDS, the LDS leaders encouraged church members to avoid public assistance if at all possible. And in 1936, ch church president Heber J. Grant, once a Democrat, but by this time a strong Republican, placed a letter to all Latter-day Saints on the front page of the Deseret News urging him to vote against President Franklin Roosevelt. Rather than following his advice, however, a majority of Mormon voters all across the state voted for FDR. In these same years, the church moved to establish its well-known church welfare program, also designed to help church members who were impacted by this stagnant economy. As soon as it was well underway, um, LDS leaders encouraged church members to turn to their local wards for assistance rather than depending on the government. But the no strings attached help the government provided remained the primary source of assistance until the economy rebounded as the nation moved toward World War II. In fact, in 1935 and 1936, public assistance was 10 times as great as the accountable assistance of the church welfare plan. That was a shock to me. I knew that it was a lot, but I didn't know it was that great. Life in Utah was better in the 1940s as the economy recovered and as the Latter-day Saints found themselves at one with the nation in their desire to defeat Japan and the Axis powers. In the immediate post-war years, the church was at pains to regather the saints who had been scattered during and immediately after the war, organizing or reorganizing the church all throughout the Mormon culture region as well as along the Pacific coast. Additionally, the church, many of whose missions had been halted due to the war, undertook extraordinary mission activities and saw the church begin to expand both in numbers and in space organized into stakes and wards. And branches, of course, many branches. The decade of the 1950s was one of, ast of astonishing activity in Mormonism's center place. Church growth was occurring outside as well as inside the United States at such an undreamed of rate that the pre-war church organization was finding it impossible to keep up with building enough buildings and finding enough lay clergy to lead all the new saints. I ran across the, uh, the memories of a um, state president from South America who at conference time went to, his, uh, uh, went to the head of the building department and said, I have uh, I've asked and asked and haven't heard from you. We need a new building in wherever it was. I can't remember exactly what place it was. And the, the head of the department just said, well, put it in writing. And he said, I did put it in writing. I never heard from you. And the man pointed to a pile as, as tall as his chair, and it says, it must be in there somewhere. <laughs> That's how 
busy the church was and the leaders were trying to keep up with the growth. What to do about the deter deteriorating urban area around church headquarters was another problem, as was managing all the genealogical material that was gathered from, from throughout the world. People probably do not know, but the great, huge church office building on the campus in Salt Lake City has its, its size and its form because it was designed to hold file cabinets that would hold all the genealogical material that was being collected from throughout the world. They did not know that this could be done on one of those little files <laughs> in, the, in the computers. They didn't know that. The church was being led by its priesthood organization and its auxiliaries, the Female Relief Society, the Sunday School, the primary organization, the Young Men's and Young Women's Mutual Aid Associations, and the heads of departments such as genealogy, buildings, mission programs, and so on. Each auxiliary and department had a few employees, but at that time in the 1950s, the church had no real bureaucracy to begin to take charge of the statistics and everything else about church growth. What it did, however, what it did have was a, I'm sorry, I keep putting however in there, it's not in the paper. Well, what it did have was a first-rate public affairs department, which had been in existence for well over half a century. The, the de that department caught up the excitement of the age and stayed busy issuing press releases, disseminating information about the church in, and its growth, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, called America's, America's Choir by um, President Eisenhower, and its successful members, like swimsuit designer Rose Marie Reed, golfer Johnny Miller, and actor Vic DeJory. At the same time, recognizing that the public perception of the Latter-day Saints um, was growing even ever more positive, its members promoted the publication of articles about the Saints in the print media. One such article was published as originally written, and that's important, originally written in Reader's Digest competitor, Carnet, in April 1952. Despite warnings that it was filled with falsehoods uh, from the dean of the University of Utah's graduate school, Sterling McMurrin, to whom the Carnet sent it for review, he said it was filled with falsehoods. Written by Andrew Ham Hamilton, it was published at Written, and it was called Those Amazing Mormons. It provided a picture of a people with all the Boy Scout virtues who didn't drink alcohol or caffeine, didn't smoke, kept a year's larder full of foodstuffs, and of greatest importance, took care of their own. It was a portrait of a d attractive, productive people who had managed to get through the Great Depression without depending on government handouts that the LDS Church adopted and as it publicized its church welfare plan and its food storage policy. Moreover, as lifelong members of the church, lifelong Mormons became models for all the new LDS converts church members, too, adopted this picture of themselves as well. In an environment filled with concerns about atom bombs, stories about personal air raid shelters, and the dangers of communism, this, the embrace of such a picture called for forgetting the reality of the Great Depression years and the veracity of stories about Mormonism's experimentation with a radical social system that could have changed the nature of 
of the Mormon family and a theo-democracy theo that would have made the Mormons stand apart from other Americans and have kept it a small group, a small ethnic group. The Mormons who probably celebrated the picture of those amazing Mormons more than any other was most likely Apostle Ezra Taft Benson, whose tenure as Agriculture Secretary had in, in Washington had convinced him that communism was the greatest of all dangers to the United States and to his church. In a very real sense, over partisan politics took a back seat in the 30 years after World War II. The state voted for Harry Truman for president in 1948, but for a Republican governor in 1950. And in the next three decades, the, vote, the state continued to vote for Democrats for president and Republicans for years, uh, for governor for years, or vice versa vote for Republicans for president and Democrats for the governor. But at the ground level, a conservative movement started spreading across, across Utah, much like the newly introduced kudzu plant was spreading across the South. <laughs> the leaders, I live there, I know about kudzu. <laughs> The leaders in this radical conservatism were Apostle Benson, his son Reed, who was by that time the vice president of the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the uh, John Birch Society, uh, Ernest Wilkinson, president of BYU, and W. Cleon Skousen, a member of the BYU faculty who had worked for the FBI and later was chief of police in Salt Lake City and who was writing <coughs> books at that time about the dangers of communism and the way it had been a danger all through history. Interestingly enough, Cleon Skousen's books have had a revival of popularity since they were taken up by one new conservative uh, Mormon. But it was at this time that the books had enormous popularity. Though I noticed that in one of the um, reports about what government, what Republican candidates were reading, uh, the governor of Texas was reading a Cleon Skousen book <laughs> as uh, one of his, uh, one of the things he was reading these days. Uh, Benson, who had always been conservative, but during his years in Washington, as a member of Eisenhower's cabinet, he became so arrogantly anti-communist that this view came to dominate his thinking. During his presence in the nation's capital, um, excuse me, uh, fellow members of the Council of the Twelve had been so greatly appreciated, appreciative of his high station in the national government that expressions of pride in the task he was accomplishing were the general rule in comments about him, even among those apostles who would oppose his political position in the years after he returned to Salt Lake City. But during his first post-cabinet interview with church president David O. McKay, he was accompanied by his son Reed, who was already active in the John Birch Society. Benson returned to Utah, clearly hoping that his church would move directly into the Birch Society's fold. He clearly hoped that his advocacy for this extremely anti-communist political organization could convince President McKay to support it. Although McKay never placed the church over which he presided in league with the anti-communist cause, he did give Benson permission to make an anti-communist address to the LDS uh, annual conference. Benson had 
allowed the magazine published by the society to use his photograph on the pub cover, and he almost managed to get President McKay to allow his photograph to be used on the cover of the John Birch Society magazine as well. But even after it was set in print, this was headed off by Apostle Hugh B. Brown, a Democrat. But the radical conservatism of Apostle Benson surely promoted the spread of support for the cause he supported among Latter-day Saints in local wards throughout the, state, throughout the state and the region. In the fall of 1960, I moved with my family to Logan, Utah, returning to school that year and changing my major from music to history. In the course of my studies, I had to take a senior seminar in which students were required to write term papers using primary sources. At least two of the topics selected by the seniors in the class had to do with Utah during the Depression. It was there that I learned the fact that Mormons in Utah had been as likely as any other poor or unemployed citizen of the United States to take advantage of the New Deal assistance programs. That was one of Utah's deep, dark secrets. It did not go along with those amazing Mormons who took care of themselves. The other, interestingly enough, at that time was the existence of polygamy in Mormon history. It was played down so much that one would have no, hardly known that it was there. The attitude was that only two or three percent of the Mormons practiced it anyway. And the picture of, the, the picture of Mormonism presented to our family when we were visited almost weekly by ward mis missionaries was the picture of those amazing Mormons. Perhaps they thought we were potential converts. <laughs> you think? <laughs> uh, they don't know how strong it is to be lifelong Methodists. <laughs> this effort to forget the past was very much a part of the move toward political conservatism that we saw around us. And a part of this move, I do not talk about it because Max Mueller is going to talk about the problem of the blacks, at least in, 19, uh, in 2012, at that time was that many, many of the conservatives thought that the asking of the church to make blacks uh, uh, equal to whites in obtaining the uh, Mormon priesthood was a communist plot, as Ezra Taft Benson and the John Birch Society said. This effort to forget the past was so important at that time. Consequently, I was not surprised when I was told by the director of the LDS Church Historical Department that when the Deseret Press published the Building the City of God, Community and Co Cooperation Among the Mormons by Arrington Fox and May, a member of the Council of the Twelve was so distressed that he asked that the book be shredded. So much for remembering and celebrating Mormonism's history and its story of the extraordinary efforts the saints made to live as had the early Christians. To Elder Benson, for he was the apostle asking for the shredding of the book, Christian communitarianism was simply too much like 20th century communism that threatened the world. When Benson became president of the church, liberal Mormons were relieved that instead, it, instead of taking the fir church further into political conservatism, he turned his attention to moving the Book of Mormon from icon to text by asking every church member to make reading the Mormon scripture a devotional duty 
and the building of LDS temples and celebrating the ordinances therein. This movement from icon to text was also happening in the evangelical movement as at that time the King James Version of the Bible was sold to Protestants throughout the country to use on their coffee tables. But as Martin Marty once said, it sat there but was never opened. And in Mormon households, the Book of Mormon was the same. It often sat there, but only in the modern era has it been read as a devotional duty and its, its content discovered as inspirational. It was that his work in the, it was not that um, his work in politics was not important. No doubt he was certain that it was possible to be a good Democrat and a good, and a good Mormon. It was simply that his work in the area of politics was done. Utah in the remainder of the Mormon culture region is, if not more, is as, if not more conservative than any other part of the nation. Thanks to knowing about, considering, forgetting the past, and providing the world with a picture of Mormons as amazing. Thank you.